You know why ministers take their watch off right before they preach sometimes? No reason. <laughs> I stole that from my favorite rabbi, actually. What a beautiful, beautiful day and what beautiful music and poetry and community in this place this morning. And I want to invite us all to go uh, on a little journey backwards, back through the last day, the last week, the last year, a little further back. Now, if you're like me, sometimes it's hard to remember even what I had for dinner last night, but I want to go back even further to the 1100s. I remember it like it was yesterday. (laughs) The Dark Ages is the name that I was taught about that period. The Roman Empire had long since collapsed and thrown Europe into chaos. And it was from that chaos in Europe that the term Dark Ages was coined. Now hearing that phrase, that term, Dark Ages... I made the assumption that the candle of humanity had been all but snuffed out at that time. It was only later that I discovered that whole premise was this wide. I was looking through a lens that was this wide. My history book had been written by the descendants of the winners of history so far. They were written by Europeans. Now, far from the chaos that may have reigned in Europe of the time, things were anything but bleak. In fact, some of the most innovative thinking, research, and discovery of all human history was happening outside of Europe. In Nishapur in Persia, Omar Khayyam may have been the one that coined this proverb that I bring you today. He said, of fools, those who don't know and don't know they don't know, they are fools. Avoid them. Then he says, those who don't know, but know that they don't know, they are students. Guide them. Next, those who know, but don't know that they know. They are misguided. Enlighten them. Wake them up. Lastly, those who know and know that they know, they are the wise. Follow them. The 12th century Persian polymath, Omar Khayyam, was just a rich fountain of wisdom and work in mathematics and poetry and religion, philosophy. He was one of the Many great, great teachers of all time that came out of this brilliant period of flourishing in the Islamic world, Asia and Africa. You may recognize some of the other names, Avicenna, Hafiz, Rumi, Maimonides. Now that proverb about fools, students, misguided and wise... forms the framework for what I would like to explore today. It's the reason my eighth grade history text left me with the impression that there was nothing of significance happening in the 12th century anywhere in the world because European culture was just re-emerging at the time.
Imagine it. Clans from Europe had merged into fiefdoms, which merged into duchies, which merged into kingdom, kingdoms and nation states and empires. And it's from these empires that the map of the world as we know it today was written. In this narrative, everything was subsumed by these empires. Whole continents and groups of people lost their identities and control over their own destinies. They were seen as resources to be controlled and converted to wealth. Even the original European tribes themselves lost their identities to this new narrative. The Picts, the Parisi, the Goths, these people never went away, but their stories have gotten lost. Their identities were swept up and tumbled together with hundreds of others, eventually funneling into what the U.S. Census Bureau refers to today as white. My whiteness today has been enculturated so much that I don't think about it. I don't have to. It's our society's default setting. Lucky me. Whiteness reigns supreme. It's just a fact. Whiteness supreme. White supremacy. Now this month's themes are honesty and compassion. And in that vein today, I would like to talk about difficult truths. Difficult truths. I invite us all to consider some truths and how we might respond to them. Again, using Kayam's proverb, let's start with where I was. Those who don't know and don't know they don't know, they are fools. Avoid them. That was me. For years, I never questioned the societal narrative I'd been born into. I'd worked hard, I made mistakes, I came back from them, and I, I knew that the same opportunity existed for anyone, anyone willing to do the same, regardless of religion or skin color or anything else. I was Kayam's fool. I didn't know, and I didn't know that I didn't know. I didn't wish harm on anybody. In fact, I wanted the best for the world. And I knew that the world looked like this. Those who don't know, don't know they don't know. So, fast forward to the next chapter in my life. Those who don't know and know they don't know, they are students. Guide them. So about a decade and a half ago, slack-jawed in amazement, I sat in the sanctuary at First Unitarian Church in Cincinnati under that beautiful Tiffany Rose window and the whole world opened up before me. Reverend Sharon Dittmar was in the pulpit and she was doing the work of enlightenment, laying down truth after truth. And I was shocked to discover just how much I didn't know. Reverend Sharon told the story of the Reverend W.H.G. Carter, Unitarian pastor in Cincinnati's Church of the Unitarian Brotherhood, around the turn of the 20th century. It was America's only black Unitarian church at the time, the only one. Reverend Carter sought fellowship with our American Unitarian Association, but as the report from Boston put it, they sent someone out to interview and collect the facts. So as the report from Boston put it, I do not recommend fellowship for Mr. Carter or subsidy for his movement. In other words, he wasn't a good fit for a white, wealthy, highly educated religion. Carter's congregation was in the poorest part of Cincinnati in the West End. There was 
crime and poverty, houses stacked on one another like you see today in a third world, in a favela. I want to call attention to something. I just said third world. That's another part of this narrative that I'm enculturated to that assumes that I'm part of a first world. So, Carter wasn't a good fit. As I sat in that room and heard the story of this dedicated, determined, Unitarian pastor ministering to his eager congregation with the potential of spreading this amazing religion all over Cincinnati and all over the world, I got excited. That story that day turned me from Kayam's fool to student. I still didn't know, but now I was aware of it. So, I said the words white supremacy earlier, and I, I still twitch and tingle and cringe when I hear those words. Why is that? They're only words. The best I can do is to tell you what I feel. I'm, I'm no Nazi. I'm no follower of Steve Bannon. I'm, in fact, I'm so opposed to that ideology that I've devoted the remainder of my working life to dismantling that ideology. How dare anyone imply that I, I of all people, could be participating in white supremacy? Well, I'd like to show you something else. This is Buckminster Fuller's Dymaxion map of Earth. The same map, the same information that we just saw on the map that everyone knows to be true displayed a different way. The first time I saw that, I didn't know what it was. If you're listening to this and not Watching it, it's as if a flat, a sphere made of flat surfaces has had the continents and the earth projected onto it, and then it's been split in straight lines and spread out onto a flat surface. All the same information's there. I see Africa, and I see Asia, and Australia. I see North America and South America. But that is not the world map. Everyone knows what a world map looks like, right? Back to my indignance. Time has taught me. In fact, life has taught me. When I get fighting mad about something, that's an invitation to me to do some digging and soul searching. Why do a few little words have power over me like that? White supremacy. Hmm. On to Kayam's misguided, the stage to which I aspire. He says, those who don't know, or you could say those who don't yet know that they know, or excuse me, those who know, but they don't know that they know, they are misguided. Enlighten them. In the last few weeks, we've reached a crisis. I looked up crisis in the dictionary, and it is a turning point among our Unitarian Universalist leadership. Peter Morales, our president, the president of our Association of Congregations, and one-time member here, has resigned. As has our chief operating officer and our director of congregational life, the precipitating moment for all of this, a qualified, somewhat, some would say highly qualified candidate for a leadership position who happened to be a person of color, got passed over for that job in favor of another white man. The reason given? The candidate wasn't a good fit. I'd like to show you another picture.
if you're listening to this or if you're wondering what you're looking at, this is a racial dot map put together by the University of Virginia with one dot representing one person. And it's overlaid the census data on top of an interactive map so that we can get a geographic distribution of who lives where in our nation. Color-coded dots represent different races with blue being the predominant color. Blue represents white, green represents black, and orange is Asian, yellow is Hispanic, and then there's brown, which is everything else, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. Lastly, one more slide. This is a graph from Pew Research showing our UU makeup as of 2014. And those same demographic buckets were 88% white, 1% black, 4% Latino, 7% other, less than 1% Asian. Why do I bring these statistics up, maps and statistics? We're in church. How, how, is, this, how is this worship? How is this sacred? Well, our worship theme is honesty and compassion. And though I want to think of compassion as being nice, I've learned that it isn't always about that. Sometimes the compassionate truth isn't a nice one. But we Unitarian Universalists live in a covenant that calls us to affirm and promote justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. It's our second principle. We're also called to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. That's our first principle. Difficult truth. What we say is everyone matters. What we demonstrate is otherwise. Whiteness reigns supreme in our nation and in our Unitarian Universalist house. And it is time to change that. Now, we welcome all beliefs. In fact, we even celebrate them. And yet, and yet, can you go back one slide? And yet, how welcoming are we really? Now, if you identify as a person of color or indigenous, I am so glad you choose to be among us. And for everyone, however you identify, I hope we can journey together toward holiness and wholeness. Now, Kayam's wise ones, those who know and know that they know, they are the wise. Follow them. When I'm in doubt and I need answers, I look for the wise ones. You can spot them. The world can be going to hell in a handbasket and they'll be the ones still patiently working away because they know what to do. Follow them. When it comes to this particular difficult truth, I am all too happy to follow the lead of those who know. My wife, Meredith, my beloved, is Latina. She's amazing and, dare I say, my biggest fan. <laughs> and yet she's been really irritated with my fragility around all of this. When the election didn't go the way I wanted last fall, she wasn't devastated like I was. When she heard the news, she raised an eyebrow and she said, and what exactly has changed? Sweetheart, if you think this hasn't been here all along, you are kidding yourself. The only difference is that now it's out in the open. For people of color, white supremacy, again, whiteness being supreme, it's a condition. White supremacy has been a daily reality. As one friend at the, at the UUA, or one friend put it about the UUA situation, to me, it's humiliating to me. Now that white culture has decided it's a crisis, now it gets to be a crisis. 
We've been saying this all along, so Andy, when you come along and get up in arms about this suddenly being a crisis, it feels like a slap in the face to me. Ah, one last uncomfortable truth. This one is of mine. A grandmother visits me in my dreams sometimes. Now, none of the grandmothers I knew looked like her. But there she is when I'm the hottest of hot messes. She is as old as time and she smells like the strong earth. She has a loving smile and a twinkle in her eye and a presence that I can actually feel. I could have made just the most colossal mistake of my life and alienated everyone around me. There she'd be in my dream. She would say, Honey, I love you. You can do better. Now come on, get back up. There's work to do. I wonder if she is God or goddess. Following the words of Kayam, trying to help me move from fool to student to misguided to wise. For now, I know what needs to be done. It's time for me to search inside and be honest and compassionate with myself. It's time for me to rediscover and reclaim my own identity. That's why I choose to wear the kilt. Whiteness is a construct. It's a narrative with different groups being allowed in or out based on notions of power or privilege. Whiteness is somebody else's story. I choose to reclaim my own story. My heritage is from the British Isles. This is the Highland Gray Tartan and it represents a piece of my family tree and it represents names and faces and traditions. Difficult truths are only difficult until you come to grips with them. Once that happens, they're somehow less scary. White supremacy isn't something I believe should be the way of the world. It isn't what I support. And it's time to destigmatize that term and recognize it simply as the current state of affairs. I got invited to a multicultural potluck several years ago and I panicked. The host said I was supposed to bring a dish from my culture. The Dominican and the Chinese and the Italian people in my work group were so excited to contribute recipes from their families. Generations of generations of these had been passed down. What did I have to contribute? Mac and cheese? Spam? I don't know, I'm just white is what I thought. Many years later, Patricia St. Ange at the Chaplaincy Institute, and who I might add looks suspiciously like that grandmother I told you about, she helped me reframe that struggle. Andy, she said, whiteness may not give you a meaningful identity. It may be taking that identity. Why not try looking beyond that story for your story? And so for our next Touchstone Tuesday potluck, I just may bring haggis. Or maybe not. In the meantime, 270 congregations, almost a quarter of all Unitarian Universalist congregations are participating in a white supremacy teach-in on April 30th or May 7th. They have materials prepared. There are speakers that are, will be available by video conference. And it's amazing. There's this wave of recognition sweeping across the country to finally pull this term out of the closet examine it, destigmatize it, and say, okay, if we don't believe in it, then let's get to work and dismantle it, shall we? Many of you are the wise ones. You are Kayam's wise ones. You know and you know that you know. I hope we make space in this congregation to join the teach-in. Our UU faith gives us the tools that we need to meet this mission our mission, do you remember our mission empowered by love 
This church, empowered by love, we transform ourselves and serve our world. May our chalice be a beacon of hope and our sixth principle, our map, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. And justice for all means justice for you. Justice for all means justice for me. It means justice beyond the walls of Unitarian Universalism and for those inside our faith who have been marginalized for too long. Will we accept the status quo? I want to leave you with one more quatrain from Omar Khayyam. I sent my soul through the invisible, some letter of that afterlife to spell. And by and by my soul returned to me and answered, I myself am heaven and hell. Beloved community, let that grandmother speak her kind, reassuring yet insistent words to us all. I love you. You can do better. Now get back up. There's work to do. Amin, Ashe, and blessed be.